France depends on nuclear for more than 80% of its power. It was the one country in Europe that didn't have to worry about what the Russians did with natural gas. How can the French do it uh, without creating the problems that you worry about? Well, that uh, is a problem, natural gas imports for them, but it, uh, for Europe, but it's not for us. We import about 15% of our natural gas, and it's essentially all from Canada. Now, we went to war with Canada twice in the late 1770s and the year 1812, and they whipped us both times, and they're not that mean, and they don't cut off our gas. Uh, they're not ruled by a Putin. Uh, so I think that uh, our electricity set of issues is a set of issues about cost and about cleanliness and cleaning up the grid both in, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, carbon and also making the grid more survivable. The, the control systems of the grid are really very fragile now and hackers can get into it and the rest. We've got to fix that. But we don't have an import problem with respect to what we use to produce electricity. We have that problem with oil for transportation, but not with respect to electricity. Others? Yes. Well, I just I have to get back to the security issue on nuclear because I, I hear it quite a bit. It's a it's a concern that people have and an understandable concern. But I would just point to some of our major international challenges today on security. Pakistan with a nuclear weapon, North Korea moving toward a nuclear weapon, other states are not having built a new nuclear plant since nineteen seventy eight, hasn't stopped that. And when you look at the way spent rods are contained and held in this country, they're in a very secure place. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission makes sure of that. Now, what France has done and what Japan is doing, because there are a lot of countries that are going nuclear more and more and, and a lot of countries that already are, they're reprocessing. You're able to reduce the spent, the, the fissionable material in those nuclear rods from 97%, which is what's left in them now, to 2 to 3%, which vastly reduces the amount of material you have to worry about. And by the way, if we took all the spent nuclear rods we have in this country from the 104 nuclear plants that we have, they would fill up one football field to the height of the goalposts, which is different than most people's conception. But it's a, it's a real concern, except that I would say that I think it's a red herring in this case in the sense that we have very, very high standards. Are they perfect? No, nothing's ever perfect on anything. But when the 9-11 Commission did, it look, did its look of threat matrix, and you know this better than I, but certainly you can relate to this, chemical plants rated above nuclear plants as likely targets for terrorists because they were less secure and more able to create the kind of explosion that they wanted to see rather than try to get a rod out in order to be able to use it because if you breach those holding tanks or the, the cement uh, reinforced concrete that are, are holding the, the rods today, you're not going to get very far. So I don't think that's the place, frankly, to my mind, that that's the issue that ought to make us determine whether to go forward or not with nuclear. And I'm just, I'm just very interested in the, in the Waxman bill with the kinds of targets we're setting for ourselves by 2050 in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. If EPA, this administration's EPA, in looking at the bill, says it's, it anticipates it can only be done with a 150% increase in nuclear, I don't think we're going to get there, and I'm not, I'm not advocating for that. I'd like to keep it at 20%. Jim, we, we, we probably could all get deep and technical on, on reprocessing and what's left and, and the, you know, the heat load of uh, the actinides left in reprocessing, but I don't think the audience would be that interested in it. Jim really said, I think, what the fundamental issue is around nuclear, which is it's very expensive to build. Once you've built it, it runs very cheaply. So the 20% uh, of nuclear that's in our fleet right now that we get from uh, pre-existing plants uh, runs, it's profitable, it's easy, you know, and, and we need to maintain that uh, and maintain the safety of those plants moving forward. But the reason no one's built a new nuclear plant, uh, and even with the generous subsidies that were given uh, in the 2005 energy bill that pres President Bush supported, no one still has really got a plant on the, uh, on the drawing board, although there's some uh, new uh, uh, permits being requested, is that it's really expensive to build. It's a lot more expensive than putting uh, gas online, as Jim uh, suggested. Uh, you'd have to put a, a high price on carbon pollution from coal-fired power plants. Now, I think Jim and I are both in favor of that because carbon is putting a burden in other ways uh, on our economy uh, and certainly on our planet. Uh, but you'd have to begin by putting a very high price on carbon, and I wonder whether uh, 
Christy and Karen would agree that that's the path we ought to go down. I think that's uh, what we see as the path that's coming in the future. But would you agree that in order to bring the, the promise of nuclear on stream, you're prepared to put a high price on carbon from, from uh, polluting power plants, particularly from coal plants? I think it's important to get the facts on the table. Uh, there are a, a number of companies, 20 to be exact, that have put forward applications to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to build new nuclear plants. Uh, there is an appetite. The loan application process of the Department of Energy uh, to reduce the cost of capital has been oversubscribed. And the Congress is contemplating adding more, and I think they should, because we have a demonstrated expertise. And we would recreate a manufacturing base in this country that we let go to Korea and to Japan, and that would create great jobs here at home. So I want to be clear that there is industry appetite and that there is capital out there, and we need to match those two, two things up and move ahead. On the point on France, let's also remember that France was the only country in the European Union that was able to reduce its CO2 emissions greatly. And why? because 80 percent of their electricity came from nuclear power. So if you want to reduce CO2 emissions, you have to have nuclear power, particularly with the ambition targets that Christy mentioned, mentioned that are being considered in Congress today. I, John, didn't get a, I didn't get a yes, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're going to see it. If, if we have a carbon-constrained economy, and I've been arguing that this is going to happen, no matter, well, frankly, well, would you who, support won, it? who won the last election, yes, I'm in favor of a cap-and-trade program. The, devil is in the details and how fast you do it and how deep the cuts are. We saw with the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments on SO2 that if you structure the program correctly and give the private sector some incentive to do the right thing as well as having some punishment at the end of the day if they didn't, that they can do incredible things. Uh, they reduced SO2 below what was called for in the regulation. They did it in half the time, and they did it at half the cost that was estimated. That's going to be the key. And to think, though, that what I worry is if the thinking behind where we put these caps is 10 years, in 10 years we want to be carbon free, that's going to really put our economy into a tailspin. I'm not against, and I think the price will go up. And right now you can see the Chicago Climate Exchange is trading carbon, and of course Europe is trading carbon because they, they have a cap and that's created the price. We're going to see that. There are ways to make it so that it doesn't put our economy, doesn't set it back and doesn't put us on the skids. Well, the, president, the devils are in the details. The president's call for 20 percent uh, reduction uh, below 20, 2005 levels in the bill that you referred to. Governor uh, reduces now 17 percent below 2005 levels. So I don't think anyone in the political arena is suggesting that you can get uh, completely carbon free in 10 years. I know that no, that uh, Vice President Gore has put that out as a goal, and I think there's great promise for renewables in the system uh, to get us pretty far towards that goal. But but I think that in the in the practical politics, we're going to move down this track in a way that's sensible, that's going to create jobs, and it's create new industries and new investment, particularly on the efficiency and renewable side. 